Welcome to Stories from the Park, a Heritage Park podcast. Hi, I'm Kasaya Quill, Chief Curator. And I'm Dominic Terry, Communications Manager here at Heritage Park. We are located on Treaty 7 land in Calgary, Alberta, a place where visitors come to learn about the history of all those who have gathered here and where Indigenous people proudly share cultural traditions and tell stories about their rich heritage, history, and attachment to the land. Today we're talking about the history of energy and energy transformation in Alberta. Our guest is Peter Trzakian, an economist and author. He's also the creator of Energy File, a multimedia project on energy. Hi, Peter. Thanks for doing this with us today. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for coming in. It's so exciting to have you here. Uh, Before we get into talking about your subject, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be interested in energy transition? Well, yeah, sure. It's a long story, so I'll try and keep it really tight. I mean, uh, I uh, graduated a long time ago with a degree in geophysics, and that got me into the oil and gas business, which was my first exposure to energy. And then I branched out and took degrees in economics and finance and got into the finance world in the 1990s, financing technology companies, uh, but being in Calgary, inevitably, technology and energy and specifically oil and gas overlap. Uh, But I was always more interested in a holistic picture of how things work, especially energy related. And so was always keeping my eye out on how things changed even before energy transition was a word or a phrase. And my first book, A Thousand Barrels a Second, which came out in 2005, 2006, actually, uh, it was written in 05, really spoke about how the world of energy transitions work, you know, how we went from wood to coal, coal to oil, oil to gas to nuclear and so on, and why, and, you know, bearing in mind this was written in 05, how things are likely to need to change given unsustainable issues on both the supply side and the demand side. And that led to the second book, which was called The End of Energy Obesity, which talked about the inefficiencies in the demand side. And so between those two books and now a a solid career in energy coming at it from all angles, uh, I started really thinking hard about energy transition, particularly as it related to my day job, which was really in the financing of uh, energy companies and not just oil and gas, but any kind of energy companies. And so they're uh, really a solid footing by, I would say, 2010, 11, and really working on it. And of course, the whole energy transition momentum really started happening post, I would argue, 2015, 2017, all the discussion. And so all the work that I've been doing throughout my career all starts coming together. What um, Alberta is, of course, at the forefront of of the energy industry for such mm-hmm. a long time. Why don't, can you give us just a little bit of kind of the, Alberta's history? Um, I guess sure. you know from from way way back, uh, you know, up until today of kind of the, the transitions that we've gone through. Yes, well, I mean, uh, you can take it as far back as you want. I mean, Indigenous peoples have been here uh, time immemorial, and obviously using agrarian methods of keeping warm, whether it's uh, burning bison dung, uh, insulating themselves with animal furs and teepees and things like that, to when the first settlers started emerging and taking up agricultural practices. So we can quantify that as uh, the first era of Alberta, which was like many other societies, you know, based on what I would say biofuels, because at the end of the day, we are using agricultural resources uh, as our fuel sources. Um, you know, late 1800s into the early 1900s, certainly before the even Alberta was even a province. Of course, by that time, the Industrial Revolution was uh, well established in Europe, burning coal and using that as a fuel source. 
Uh, so that came to North America and ultimately to the West and the realization that, yeah, we have a lot of coal here too. Uh, and cities or villages or towns or whatever you would call them at the time, uh, like Drumheller, were really the Fort McMurray of the day. There was also a part of Alberta known as the Coal Branch, which stemmed from Nordegg uh, in West Central Alberta and down. And then in Southern Alberta, Canmore and the Banff, Bankhead area in there. These were all prolific areas that produced coal. So the emphasis of using Alberta's resources as primary fuels shifted from agricultural to coal. And then there was the overlap with the first discoveries of meaningful quantities of oil and gas, which was in the early 1900s, or starting in Waterton, then moving up Turner Valley, and then ultimately mid-1900s, Leduc, uh, and so on. And that really brought on the oil and gas era. And a lot of coal workers, actually, in the early part of the 1900s, then migrated into oil and gas. And so, obviously, the next question is, uh, where are we going next, right? And Alberta says, well, we're already going there. I mean, there's a, we are leading the country here in the development of renewables. And this is the privileged situation of Alberta, is that we have all the primary resources imaginable that we can put to work. I mean, we've got agriculture, both in terms of uh, biofuels and in terms of agricultural crops to forestry and wood coal, oil, gas, but we have sun in copious quantities, particularly sun, southern Alberta. Uh, I think we can all agree we have a lot of wind. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, we have it all. And the history of Alberta's primary energy is just shifting the economy from resource to resource and uh, and managing it. So um, what, do you, what do you think has been the biggest transition um, Alberta has had to make uh, in regards to energy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the word transition needs to be defined or thought about before I can answer that question, because right. in the, you know, in the purest sense, transition means getting off one thing, it diminishes, and then you get on another. So if we think about consumer electronics or what's happened in the span of the last two, three decades, a great example would be, say, going from DVDs to streaming video. Okay, so we transitioned from DVD players and DVDs, and we got onto streaming videos. And that transition was, you know, there's still some people who play DVDs, but you know, the last of the stores are closing down services for dvds so it's you know that that's a true transition or substitution mm -hmm. uh, in the world of energy it's not so simple on the primary fuels typically you do have some level of substitutions as that biofuels get replaced by coal but coal gets replaced by oil gets replaced by natural gas in power generation in some instances in some sectors of the economy it goes away altogether but not completely necessarily and so what we see in Alberta is a more of a diversification of the primary energy sources we use, rebalancing and re uh, things. And, and so it's not necessarily, and this is in most jurisdictions around the world, is that you don't see full 100% substitution of any one thing. You see repurposing and reusing of the way you get it, repurposing, reusing the infrastructure that delivers it. Uh, so in answer to your question, what is the most significant transition? Well, certainly uh, going from agricultural to coal was big and coal to oil and gas was big. But now that we have the infrastructure after well over, uh, like I'll call it 120, 130 years, that we have infrastructure that spans all the different types of things. Like Certainly we're going to be off of coal as a primary power generation. But there is plenty of infrastructure that's going to be repurposed to some of the newer types of uh, energy carriers and so on. I wonder if it go back to something that you had talked about before, and we're talking a lot about renewables now, and, and that's kind of, that's obviously the future. Uh, mm -hmm. 
we're seeing a lot of pushback from people in, uh, you know, especially at the worker level of that, a little bit of consternation probably about what the future means for them. Was there that same kind of idea? You said that coal workers went into oil and gas. Did they have, was there reporting on that kind of thing? Was there consternation on their point of, you know, we want to keep working at coal uh, instead of oil and gas or is oil and gas flash mm-hmm. in the pan kind of thing there? Absolutely. I mean, if you look back at the literature, one of the primary source historical sources of coal workers in the 1910s and certainly into the 20s, there was a lot of consternation about the rise of the oil and gas business and also competition from other coal producing jurisdictions against which Alberta coal found it difficult to compete because of a variety of quality issues, distance to market, and so on. So, I mean, consternation about what happens to incumbent workers is nothing new. I mean, it even happens in every other industry, whether you're a you know, a newspaper journalist that has to adapt to the new way of social media and other types of dissemination of news. This is, this is nothing new. And I think what I can tell you is that if you look at the history of Alberta over the course of the last 130 years, it, it certainly is a story of adaptation. And that when you have the, I'll call it the emergence of new, it creates consternation in the status quo. And there is growing pains in adaptation. And I would suggest that we're sort of in that phase now. Uh, but it's we're, we're definitely entering period. Where, I mean, there's a lot of renewable projects that have been developed and are on the books to be developed. So uh, it's it's emerging that it's actually an expansionary phase and opportunity phase as much as it is um, also a recognition that hey, like we can use all the existing infrastructure and adapt and and workers and so on. And by the way, I mean, oil and gas is not going away for many decades uh, by general acknowledgement. So it's just also finding the right markets as the whole restructuring of the way we use energy takes root. What are you kind of seeing as the next transition? Where, where mm-hmm. are we heading next? Yeah. Well, again, bearing in mind the definition of the word transition, I mean, it's not so much a transition, in my opinion, as a diversification of how we tap into a lot of the natural resources that we're so privileged to have, and also transformation of our incumbent industries to adapt to the societal desire and necessity to decarbonize. So existing infrastructure is looking to be repurposed in other ways, say, you know, blending with biofuels or uh, hyd- hydrogen and things like that. Well, again, we're we're in a privileged situation where we've had over a century of development of our infrastructure, and it's really an adaptation going forward. And so, you know, I I don't know, to be honest, if transition is the right word. It's an I, I think the, a better word is adaptation uh, of our economy to the new realities of what energy consumers want as Mm -hmm. a feature set in the energy that they use. And one of the dominant feature sets that they want is that a unit of energy is a unit of much cleaner energy. Great. Do you think that we've done a very good job of government, industry, of that ad- adaptation? Or do you think that we could have done it better? Do you think that we can do it better going forward? Mm-hmm. I think we can do it better, to be honest. I mean, it, it, it's, it doesn't, none, there's none of these transition slash transformation slash adaptations ever really go that smoothly, to be honest, if you look historically. Um, and the desire is really to try and learn from those well, I don't think we're doing a great job of doing that because it's easy to forget the history of how all this stuff worked. I will say that this transition transformation is particularly complicated because of the accelerated agenda 
In other words, net zero by 2050 is challenging enough, but there are some pretty aggressive targets that are being put in front of us for even 2030, which was only seven less than seven years away. So I think that if we are to achieve such aggressive targets, then there has to be more holistic and collaborative thinking and actions. And so can we do a better job? I do believe so. But how that happens is a really a subject of a very long podcast. <laughs> it's, I think beyond the scope of this one. Yeah. Speaking of kind of history and specifically the lessons we can learn from that, you've developed a program called Energy File and Heritage mm -hmm. Park uses it in its form called Story Seeker. Can you tell us a little bit about that website and what its purpose is and what people can learn when they go to it? Yeah, really Energy File which is my passion project from years and years and years was really to try and create lessons from actual historical anecdotes, such as we talked about. So for example, what can we learn about the Bankhead coal mine, which is just a few minutes north of Banff, the town of Banff? It's a ghost town. Mm. And it went into demise because of substitution by better grades of coal and ultimately by the use of diesel in train locomotives. You know, recognizing that Banff was on the, is on the Trans-Canada uh, CP rail line mm -hmm. and that, and that uh, trains used to stop there to basically get more fuel and coal and also drop passengers off for the Banff Springs Hotel. Right. Okay. But the town of Bankhead went to the mine. So what can we learn from that experience from a business perspective, from a societal perspective? So I started writing short stories that really form the basis of also what I call book clubs. Right? So you don't have to read a whole book. You just have to invest 20 minutes in a short story to be able to learn sort of the lessons and have a conversation and get people thinking, as I said earlier, the importance of holistic thinking, how to optimize things, what lessons can we learn from the past, and so on. And so Heritage Park has graciously recognized the value of this because many of the artifacts that I talk about or the stories are embedded in Heritage Park. All right. So how can we basically team up with Heritage Park to bring those stories alive and put them in the context of learnings that we as policymakers, corporate leaders, investors, and just sort of general public stakeholders, what can we take away so that we can lessen the chaos and friction in moving our province forward uh, without hiccups in our economy and, and, and create prosperity for the many generations ahead? So that's really the thing that the energyfile.org website at the moment has 11 stories. It has a viewport where you can see all sorts of vignette cards. Uh, those are going to be expanded. Some of those are in the Story Seeker site, which you will be able to see at Innovation Crossing at Heritage Park uh, and online. Uh, but the, the the it's really a joint project for which I'm very thrilled about and working with Heritage Park. And... Uh, I think it's just the start and the opening of the exhibition at Innovation Crossing on the 28th of June is really just a start of, I think, something that uh, Heritage Park realizes can be a really positive thing and that the park is not just a place to go with your kids and enjoy. Of course, that's a very primary objective, but it can also be used as a place to learn the lessons of the past, have a tactile ability to feel, see the objects that were part of history, large or small. Uh, and again, in the pursuit of um, learning and making better decisions about our energy future. Well, thanks for talking to us today, Peter. It was uh, It's always interesting to hear from somebody who's uh, so involved in what's happening uh, and with great perspectives. Well, great. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, encourage everyone to get out to Heritage Park and see all the great things this summer.
Yeah, we'll open our exhibit, Heated Histories, on June mm -hmm. 28th, and we'll talk all about more about this uh, energy evolution, as we call it. That's right. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Peter. Thanks.